Please join me for this morning's prayer of confession. God of mercy, we struggle. Guided by the things of this world, we have lost our way. We have not loved our neighbors. We have wasted opportunities to do good. And we have looked the other way when our sisters and brothers have cried out to us in need. Guide us back to your path. Forgive, Forgive us. us. Awaken, Awaken us. us. Transform, Transform us. Amen. God's transforming love has been poured out for all of creation. Be assured today and every day that God loves you without condition. Amen.
talk to you about service. And that's something that Jesus talks about in this morning's gospel. Jesus talks about how important it is for us to serve God. Well, how do we serve God? How do we serve Jesus? Well, I think that to serve God, we need to help each other. We need to serve each other through loving, kind actions. Can you think of a way you can serve your fellow human beings on this earth? Well, there are all kinds of ways to serve. There are all kinds of ways to help people. We see it every day. All you have to do is look around. There are groups of people who cook and bring meals to people in need. There are folks who give out socks to the homeless. And there are others who protest when they think something has gone wrong. They bring our attention. And that protest can come in many ways. It can be marching in the street. It can be writing a letter to the editor. It can be done through art. The song you just heard Erin sing comes from a group called Choirs for Climate. And they're trying to raise awareness of climate change. And they're doing it through their art and their spirituality. How amazing is that? Is there a way that you can take your interest, your art, the thing that lies deep in your heart, and use that to serve others, to serve all of creation and God? Let's have a prayer. Holy Creator, we are so fortunate to be given gifts from you Help us to share those gifts with others in ways that enlighten, encourage, and bring about positive change, bring about and share more of your love. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Someday I'll get a fancy headset so that I don't have to move the microphones around. But I kind of like the microphones. It makes me feel important. <laughs> this morning's scripture readings, please join me for a moment of silence as we gather ourselves for the scripture. The first reading is from Jeremiah in the Hebrew scriptures. Chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband says the Lord. But this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put the law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their inequity and remember their sin no more. This morning's gospel reading is from John, chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who is from Bethesda in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. 
Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, very truly, he answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my, now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said an angel had spoken. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O oh God, my strength and my Redeemer. Every week we've been having a Bible study. About 11 of us gather. When we read the Gospel together, we read the Gospel that is scheduled for Sunday. And then we have an open, free-form discussion. We begin with a brief check-in. Name something you're grateful for. Or for this week, it being St. Patrick's Day, and thinking about the luck of the Irish, we shared how we felt lucky that day. Daffodils breaking through, lilacs greening up, vaccines received. After our check-in, we have a short prayer. Someone reads the scripture out loud, and the floor is open for comments, questions, thoughts. This week, Mary spoke up first. And I'm paraphrasing. She said, I'm confused. What does Jesus mean if you love your life, you will lose it? I can't imagine Jesus would want us to be depressed or something. She's right. It is confusing. He says, those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. It's one of those times I wish Jesus was a little less contradictory, or if not contradictory, a little less paradoxical. I mean, God gave us life. It's a gift. And we're to hate it. And so began another rich Bible study discussion. Today's, today's gospel reading is not easy. It doesn't go where we wish it would go, or at least it doesn't go where I wish it would go. And where we're going is Calvary with Jesus. And it's not pleasant. As Sue said, I just don't like Lent. Lent can be a bit of a haul. And as we get closer and closer to Easter, it gets drearier and darker. This week we find Jesus already in Jerusalem. And the urgency of his hour intensifies. In between last week's reading and this week's reading, last week you'll remember was Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. In between these readings, Jesus has fed the 5,000 walked on water, healed a blind man, debated with religious authorities, 
raised Lazarus from the dead. And we also learn in John chapter 11 that the religious authorities have decided to kill Jesus. And I quote, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. And then Papias says, it is better for you to have one man die than to have the whole nation destroyed. So from that day, they planned to put him to death. And Jesus no longer walked in the open. In this morning's super dense reading, Jesus interprets his death. And we see that what the religious authorities had been wary of, that is, Jesus gaining more popularity, is happening. Our reading opens with Greek people seeking Jesus out. They are non-Jews. Perhaps they become the first Gentile disciples. It seems as though everyone is indeed coming to Jesus. His reach is expanding as his hour draws near. There's a sense of urgency in this passage, and I, I really feel it throughout the Gospel of John. Jesus seems to struggle to get his followers to understand. He announces that his hour has come. He talks about its meaning and what is expected from his followers, he embraces his fate. And if we doubt what he says, he's backed up by the voice of God, the voice who comes for our sake, not for his. There's a lot happening in this reading, but there's a thread that runs throughout it. And that is how Jesus' death will create a community and how that community is to be in the world. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. I know from chatting with a lot of you that we have a lot of serious gardeners here at First Congregational. And all gardeners know as I'm sure everyone knows, that you have to plant a seed in order to harvest a crop. Here, Jesus is the seed, and his death will ultimately bring about a new community, an image of death and resurrection. Jesus says, And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. His death, and of course his resurrection, will bring people to him. And it's not for a specific group. It's all people. Remember, the religious authorities said, everyone will believe in him. And we see evidence of that in the Greeks who come to see Jesus. The community grows just as the fruit in the parable grows. Jesus calls us into community, into relationship with each other, into relationship with God through each other. Jesus' death creates the fruit of community. And it's through this community that we can enter into a new relationship with God. Throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus invites us into this new relationship. And he uses metaphors that sometimes confuse us. New life, eternal life, new birth. And it all points to a new way of being, drawing us closer to God. Jesus and God are intimately connected to each other, connected through love. As believers in community, we are connected to God and Jesus and each other by love. As the fruit the relationship of community members is an expression of the relationship shared by God and Jesus. That's beautiful. Our relationship with each other is an expression of God's love. But what does that mean? And how do we 
live into that vision? When Jesus says, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, God will honor. It makes me think of a scene that's yet to come in the gospel, and that's when Jesus washes the disciples' feet. He serves everyone, his community. And when I think about this community that's to form upon his death, Jesus is showing us how to treat each other. The community is not typically of this world. The usual dynamics don't apply. We're to wash each other's feet, not backbite. Competition should be left at the door. And we're so lucky to be in a faith community. I grew up without community as such, really any sort, whether it be secular or religious. I grew up what is referred to as unchurched. My family didn't even celebrate high holidays at church. We're a fairly introverted group and really independently minded. You just can't tell us anything. On some level, for my family, reliance on community is seen as a weakness. My first real experience with community as a full and intentional member was when I went to seminary. And it really took me by surprise. See, I'm competitive by nature. Some may say a little bit aggressive when it comes to expressing my thoughts. I was completely unprepared for the community I found at seminary. And unlike my other academic experiences, there was no competition. What I found was collaboration and cooperation. The group appreciated the various gifts of the members and made the most of them by raising each other's gifts we learned more because we weren't busy jockeying for first place. We weren't busy blocking our minds with how we were going to respond and get one up on the person. And that created a situation where sharing was easy, learning was fun, and expansive. However, to participate in this special relationship, in this special community, I had to leave some things at the door. I had to give up parts of my smaller self, things I was proud of, things that fed my vanity. I like to be the center of attention. I like to win. And I can create a competition out of nearly anything. It just didn't fly there. And it took me a while to let go of the ways I was used to being, those ways I was nearly addicted to. It was a process, but what a reward. Through the help of my fellow seminarians, I found a new way of being. Yes, seminary was an academic setting, and it was also spiritual. The community of students created a yes and situation. It was such a wonderful and freeing experience, but for that to happen, we all needed to participate and leave certain things behind. Getting back to the question of our Bible study from Mary, in a small way, perhaps you could say we all had to lose some of the things we love in this life in order to enter into a new way of being, this new community and relationship. Jesus' death and resurrection created something. All those years ago, Jesus told us about it. A community of servants following Jesus' path. The faith community shares his love in this world. That's how it continues to bear fruit. All those years ago, Jesus gave us the parable of the wheat. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. And so it was. But how are we doing as the fruit? Are we serving? 
Do we let go of the love of our small self? Are we actually washing each other's feet? Being part of a faith community opens up so many possibilities. We have the opportunity to lead life not in lockstep with our wider culture, our culture of transactional relationships. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Our culture that puts me first, our culture that spins things to our own advantage, our culture of power plays and backstabbing, our culture that monetizes everything and uses, really abuses, people, animals, minerals, plants, well, all of God's awe-inspiring creation for ill, for short-term gain. In a faith community, as followers of Jesus, we're to leave the world's usual ways at the door. Even if we fall short, we try with an open heart. And in so doing, there's freedom and relief from the world as we enter into this new kind of joy, the joy of serving without expectation, the joy of loving and being loved without condition. And here we are, a community of faith, trying to restore, that is, trying to heal our separation from God through Christ and through our relationships with each other. Amen. Our second hymn this morning in the Pilgrim Hymnal 233, Breathe on Me, Breath of God.
So God, as we navigate our world, open our eyes and give us new awareness. Help us to turn toward you to work for justice and equality with loving and open hearts. This morning, we are especially thankful for the vaccine and that so many vulnerable people have already been vaccinated. We send our prayers and love to Edith and Flossie and all our friends living a safe but somewhat isolated life. We ask for prayers of peace and acceptance for Warren and Nina in Virginia as they begin their final earthly walk together. We pray for their families, grant them peace and acceptance also. This morning we pray for all the people living with the repercussions of racism and colonialism. And finally we pray, O oh God, for the victims and families of the recent shooting in Atlanta. We pray for the Asian American community and we ask your forgiveness for creating an environment that allows this violence and bigotry to occur. Our silence equals their oppression. Oh Lord, why do we hate and why do we hurt others? I pray that Sunday we will truly see all the people on this earth as our sisters and brothers. May you grant us peace and understanding. In your holy name we pray. And if you would join us in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.